Hello. So it's James from My Breeder Supply and uh, LoveMyPups.com. Um, today I want to talk about how to choose a stud dog. Um, this is something I know a lot about because I do a huge amount of stud service all around the Americas. Um, I shipped out seven samples yesterday, for example. That was a pretty heavy day for me, but I do a lot of this, you know, many hundreds a year. So, um, and we're going to talk about a particular product you can use for this. I'm going to plug my product at the end, but that's not really what this is about. This is about how to choose a stud dog. So the, the first thing is, is you've got to match a sensible companion for your girl. So how should you do that? Well, I'll give you the, there's physical attributes. Now, if your girl is long in the back, then I would be choosing a stud dog that is short in the back. So what will you get? Well, you're going to get puppies that are a variation between those two. Some of them might be long in the back, some are going to be short of the back, somewhere in between. So you're not going to fix it, but you will improve it. Same thing about things like in French Bulldogs, length of their muzzle, how much tail that they've got, which should be very little for a Frenchie. Um, you know, their ear set, they have huge ears, do you have too much ears? You know, these are all things that you can control by looking at what the weaknesses and strengths are between your girl and the stud dog that you're using. So. Um, you know, it's, it's a kind of an art, but you know, you've got, first thing you need to know is you need to know what your breed should look like. Now, what is the, what is the weight range that the AKC um, accepts for the show ring? That would be a good place to start. So, you know, in French years, the upper limit is 27 pounds. Well, don't go choose a 30 pound stud dog, unless you've got a very small girl that you're breeding to. So, think about the physical attributes of the dog, understand what is the right look for the dog that you're trying to produce, and then try to, strengthen the solid points about your dog and then try to find a dog that would complement and, and, and boost up the problems that you might have with physical size. Okay, so then there's other things like color. There's DNA tests that you can do to find out the coat colors of your girl. Uh, hopefully the stud dog owner would know what the coat color DNA is of their dog and between those two you can decide what range of colors you'd expect to get. Now, I've done some videos on this, you can find them uh, on YouTube, but coat color genetics is quite a bit to it. In some instances, you know exactly what you're going to get. For instance, if you had a red pied dog and you put that with a red pied dog, you're going to get a litter of all red pieds. You pretty much know what's going to happen. But some of these things are more statistical in nature. You know, it's like if you had a litter, how many girls and how many boys are you going to have? Well, on average, you're going to have 50 50, but you could be in a situation where you have more girls. Than boys or vice versa and those kind of things you can't control it just happens so this is not an exact thing where you can say hey I'm gonna get half the dogs gonna be blue and half the dogs gonna be brindle it's not gonna work that way but you can have a guess as to what you think is gonna happen and you can also know what you're not gonna get an example would be cream dogs if you want to get a cream dog both parents have to have a cream gene and give it out and if one of those dogs doesn't have a cream gene, you're not getting any cream dogs. It's as simple as that. So some of these things you can actually know what's going to happen. All right. So the next thing is, what are you going to be able to register these puppies at? Do you care about this? If you want AKC registration, then make sure that both parties, the girl and the boy, both have AKC registration. And then your girl, do you have a, a, a full rights to this dog? What I'm getting at here is the AKC, the... the person you bought this dog from in the past can specify whether you can breed this dog or not. They can't decide you can't breed it, but they can decide is whether you can get AKC registration. So make sure you've got your registration in place and you're up to date with it. All right, so the next thing is uh, timing. You know, getting a successful litter of puppies is all about getting the AI or the, or the, or the hookup, the mating on the correct day or days. So I've done other videos on that. I don't want to go into this in any great detail here, but basically you're trying to uh, mate two dogs when their progesterone level is something between a 12 and a 20. It's about a one day window. When the dog ovulates around day nine, it's, it's um, a progesterone level is gonna be about five. The next day it'll be an eight, the day after that'll be a 15. You typically breed on, an, on, an, on a vaginal or regular tie two days after ovulation. Uh, there's other techniques like transcervical inseminations and surgical inseminations. They typically take it a little bit longer before you do that. And the reason for that is, is the sperm does not have to travel all the way up the vaginal tract. So you can shave half a day to a day off. So you do it an, an insemination a bit later with those techniques. Okay, so the next thing is, is your dog healthy? 
Um, if you've got a healthy, happy dog who's a normal weight, who's active, then you're probably fine. How old is your dog? Well, your dog needs to be a minimum, I think, of a year old and preferably two heat cycles. How old is your dog on the other extreme? If your dog is very old, this can cause problems. If your dog's 10 years old, I would think seriously about maybe not doing this. Maybe in other breeds that I don't know too much about that have long lives that you can go further with this. But certainly with a Frenchie, typically, you know, five, six years old is typically the getting towards the upper limit of what's okay. And then if you've had a litter before, that gives you some idea about how this is gonna go. How does she behave with her babies? How well does she bounce back? If you had a C-section done, how do the insides look? Did she have adhesions? Those are all bits of information that you should weigh into this whole thing. All right, now you've chosen the dog. You know what day you're gonna do it, great. Does the dog have health issues that are gonna affect you? Specifically, brucellosis. You need to know that your dog and their dog does not have brucellosis. It's a sexually transmitted disease, and if you do a natural hookup between those two dogs and one of them's got brucellosis, you've got a very good chance your dog will get it. And that dog will probably never produce puppies for you again. And it'll probably affect any other dogs you have. So super important. Canine herpes virus. Um, is there a history of any canine herpes virus there? CHV1. If, if there is, that's something else you've got to watch out for. Because if you contract herpes, then your dog becomes infected and its first litter will probably not survive. So that's another one to watch out for. I've got videos on that stuff. All right, so now let's talk about breeding dogs that are not physically in the same location because that's what I, my expertise is. You've got a dog that's in some other state and the stud owner is gonna ship the semen to you and you're gonna do an artificial or surgical or transcervical insemination and you might be doing that yourself, in which case you need to understand how to do it. I've got videos on that. If you're gonna do that, you have to have the right equipment, an AI kit, not very expensive, but you've gotta have that. Uh, if the vet's gonna do it, then you wanna find a vet who's done this before, who knows what they're doing, because it makes a huge difference to your success. Again, that's in other videos. Um, but the physically, uh, the owner of the stud dog should be able to, should be asking you questions. And if they're not asking you questions, then you have to ask yourself, how much of this do they do and, and, and have they done this very many times? Because I promise you, uh, from experience of myself, that when you start doing this, there are lots of mistakes to make. And if you don't know what those mistakes are, I promise you, you're gonna run foul of them. You will absolutely do it. So let's talk about the first one, the dog itself. So do they collect from this dog on a regular basis? When was the last time they collected from a dog? If they collected from a dog three days ago, maybe you're not gonna get good collection yourself. Typically, it takes a dog about a week to recharge, and you can pull from a dog two or three times in a week, but it certainly needs to have a rest. So if you're gonna do multiple inseminations, and that dog's been used a few days ago, that might run into a problem for you with a, with a not a very good uh, semen count. How are they evaluating the semen? Are they looking at it? Are they doing a count? Do they know what to look for? When semen is shipped, it needs to be added to an extender. What kind of extender are they using? So milk-based extenders and egg yolk-based extenders, I don't think much of them, especially the milk-based extenders. I've done lots and lots of testing on this. There's a few extenders I like out there. There's one that's made by Mofa Global called Android Pro Chill Guard Plus. It's a great product, that's what I use all the time. But they need to know about extenders, and if you ask what extender they're using, they ought to be able to give you an answer immediately. If they can't, warning bells. Um, all right, so now there's the actual collection of the semen itself. How are they gonna do that? You know, how much semen are you gonna get? Um, when I collect semen, I've got a video on this. I collect just what's called a sperm-rich fraction. In a French Bulldog, it's just a couple of cc's. If I've got more than that, or let's say that a dog urinated through the process, I'm gonna centrifuge it and get rid of all the extra fluid that we don't want, and I then replace that with extender. They need to know about that. They need to be able to talk about that too. Um, the physical method that they're going to ship the semen to you. So there's, there's really um, about four different ways to do this. Now I'm going to go from the crappiest to the best. So the first one is shipping by Greyhound. I ship by Greyhound sometimes because they can ship 365 days a year. But I never ship Greyhound if there's a bus change involved. If the bus comes past your place, 
gets on the bus, goes to another terminal, goes onto another bus to go to the customer, maybe two or three bus changes. Don't even think about doing it. I promise you, it'll get lost. It'll show up days later, it'll be a disaster. And trying to track something through Greyhound is an absolute nightmare. So the only way that I ever use Greyhound is if that's the only choice I have, if it's a holiday or a weekend or Christmas day, I can use Greyhound, but it needs to be on the same bus that I put it on, is the same bus that gets the customer. United States Post Office, um, about 70% reliability. They're not very good. I use them if I'm shipping over a weekend. If I've got a ship to have it arrive on a Monday, then I will ship out USPS on a Saturday to get there on a Monday. That's the only time I'll ever use them. UPS, the Bell Brown trucks. Used to use those exclusively, I don't anymore. I was having too many problems with uh, lost deliveries or deliveries that would show up late. They've got about an 85 to 90% success rate. Um, not stellar. I mean, you know, if 10% of your shipments arrive late, that's pretty sucky, so I don't use them. I use FedEx. Whenever I can use FedEx, I think FedEx is fantastic. Um, I shipped, I think, uh, 500 shipments last year, and I think I had one shipment that got delayed because of weather, and that wasn't their fault. They are so reliable. They are very, very good. So FedEx, absolutely the way to go. So there are some things you've got to be aware of. Can you ship on a weekend with FedEx? Some areas, possibly in big cities, I cannot hear. For me, the only choices for, for shipping out FedEx is Monday through Friday for a delivery on Saturday or Tuesday, or basically Tuesday through Saturday. So I cannot collect on a Sunday or a Saturday to deliver to my customer on a Monday. And if you're shipping on a Saturday, you need to make sure that delivery is possible in your area because in some rural areas, you cannot do it. So again, the, the, the stud owner needs to know about the stuff so you don't go collect from the dog, go to FedEx and find, guess what? It can't be delivered on a Saturday. If it's, delivered on a, on, if it's shipped on a Friday, it needs to have an SDR sticker on it, something else that the shipper needs to know about. All right. So there are some details, devil's in a detail, about how to get it shipped to you. So Because you can have the best laid plans, and if the seam doesn't show up the next day, it's all for naught. Right, so very important. So physically preparing the seam. It's important that the, uh, that the seam is not cold shocked in the winter time. You've got to be careful about how you're collecting, that you're using a pre-warmed cup, that the extender that you use is always pre-warmed before it goes into uh, the collection that you don't have debris and urine and other things in the seamless collection sample. Your, your stud owner should know about these things and be able to answer those questions. Then there's the physical shipping, and this is a big thing for me. And this is why I have this product right here. This is a product that, that, that we have invented specifically for shipping semen. And you can see the little light flashing here. This thing keeps, controls the temperature in this flask. It goes into another shipping box with gel packs. This keeps the semen at exactly five degrees centigrade. It cools it down over four and a half hours to, to that temperature so it doesn't cold shock and it tracks the entire ship and it can be played back so you know what happens. To me, this has completely opened up my business. This is what makes me a success. I've got nice dogs. I've been doing this for a long time, but this is the thing that makes it possible for me to get semen. So most people are using what I call a passive system. It's just a box with gel packs. And those things really are not very reliable at all. Thank you, Russ. So what we have is, for my system, you, you get a box like this. This will be inside it, and it will have a bunch of frozen gel packs in with it as well. And those frozen gel packs make sure the environment here is too cold for the semen, but there's actually a microprocessor and a little heater inside the lid of this thing that keeps the temperature inside here exactly at the right temperature. And this can last for trips that last for multiple days. So when you're going to Europe, Canada, Mexico, to have a system like this, I think is paramount. And then anytime that you have delays, which are out of your control because of weather, then having a system like this also makes the difference between having a failure and being successful. And the whole thing is verifiable. When this shows up, it'll be flashing five times to be green. You know it's a five degrees centigrade. You know that you've, you've got a very good chance of getting your dog pregnant. Um, so I've rambled on way too long about this. Um, our website for stud dogs, for Frenchies, is www.lovemypups.com, L-O-V-E-M-Y-P-U-P-S.com. If you have any questions, worries, concerns, even if you're not using me or my product or my dogs, I'd be more than happy to talk to you anytime. 
And then if you're interested in some of our products like this and our whelping kits and our incubators, then that is mybreedersupply.com. Russ, if you'd hand me one of those little incubators up there just real quickly, just throw me one of those. I'm just gonna show you an incubator really quickly. So again, a little shameless plug here on our products. But this is an incubator that's great for transporting puppies to and from vets, from C-sections, or sick puppies can live in here for weeks. It runs off 12 volts, so it means it can run off your household adapter we give you, or you can use it in your car. And it's all completely sterilized inside. You can put bleach in this thing, there's no openings anywhere. And for those of you who have bigger dogs, well, then we have a bigger version of it. Um, and this thing here will, is, is more appropriate for bigger dogs, like you know, German Shepherds and Labradors and things like that. Both of these things work the same way. And uh, Russ is now going to keep, keep me plugging stuff here. And then we have, I'm not going to go over this got a whole video on all these things, but we have puppy starter kits, or everything you should need to, to uh, have a successful litter. I mean, all the things, you know, you've got scales in here, stethoscopes, feeding bottles, powdered goat's milk, thermometers, uh, forceps, scissors, surgical scissors, again, Again, okay, but anyway, thank you for looking at our video and best of luck being your dogs. And if we could be of any help, don't hesitate to call us. Bye-bye.